Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed.
you lived and the, the death that you died so that we can live in freedom and hope tonight. We just thank you for that. We thank you tonight that, that you can be first and foremost in the very center of this service that it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. In Jesus' name, we we approach the Father and say amen, amen. Hope you all are doing well tonight. You can, uh, you can greet the person next to you and thank them for being in church with you and then find a seat. And I just want to uh, extend a welcome. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us tonight. Welcome to our Good Friday service. We, uh, we're just glad that you're here. Glad that you chose to come out on a Friday night to be with us. I want to draw your attention to, to two different things here coming up. Of course, we have our Easter services this weekend. So I just want to invite you out to those again. If you forgot, the times of the services are 8.30 a.m. And then we've got a, a 10 a.m. service and then an 11.45 service. There's an Easter egg hunt in there at 11.15. So just want to make sure you're aware of those. You know which one you're coming to. If you don't have kids or, or young kids that want to participate in the Easter egg hunt, then, then maybe that 8.30 service is a good time slot for you to come out to service. We just want to make sure that we make room for some new families and those that are going to join us and be excited about uh, Easter with their family here at River of Life. And then also wanted to draw your attention to the following Sunday, April 7th, is our Baptism Sunday. So if you've made a decision in the past few weeks or maybe you've rededicated your life to Jesus and you just want to give it all for Him, then baptism is a great great way to do that. So I encourage you to sign up for baptisms on April 7th. It's going to be a great way to just take you into your next step uh, with Jesus following him. With that, I'm going to invite Pastor Dave up for our message tonight. I'm kind of not shocked that some of you are sitting in the same spots you do on Sunday morning. It's like, really? Can we change a little bit? Welcome back, Heather. Anyways, uh, to be honest, uh, we're going to be, it's going to be a difficult message to hear. We're going to talk about the sufferings of Jesus. And I think we all have to be obedient to, to Jesus himself, who when he was breaking bread, he, he looked at that bread and he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. You know, he never said to remember his birth. I mean, I'm, he's not saying we shouldn't, but he never said that. He said we should remember his death. And, and, and so it's going to be kind of graphic, a little bit rated R at times, violent. And uh, I was so moved by this study and I'll be doing a lot of reading. I typically don't read a lot, but I'll be reading a lot because I, I just, I'm not that smart, so I have to read a lot of this research. And it's, it's just, so I started studying a couple weeks ago and getting into it. And I, I don't know if it was Wednesday night or I don't know. I, but I usually like sleep three hours, then I get up for three, four hours, and I go sleep for another hour or two. That's usually my rhythm, just FYI. Ann knows that we're, we're good with it. And so I went to bed like it. 10 p.m. woke up at like a little after midnight and got into it and I literally was so moved I couldn't fall back asleep and because I was just on one it was like 
mixed emotions. On the one hand, really grateful for Jesus dying for us, but then really bummed out about everything he had to go through. And so, basically, this, this message is divided into four parts, historically, medically, scripturally, and personally, the sufferings of Jesus. There's a lot to, to cover. I'll be reading some, so I'm sorry about a boring reading, but if you listen, it's, it's, it's some deep stuff, really deep stuff. Tertullian, the great church father from North Africa and defender of early Christianity, was the first to popularize the death of Jesus Christ, to celebrate the cross over the cradle. And, and now we have this cross. I, you know, so, so I always thought, you know, why don't we have like an empty tomb? Why can't, why can't the symbol of Christianity be an empty tomb, like a dove flying around or something like that? And, but it's the cross because, you know, you have to, before you can be saved, you have to be lost. And before you're really lost, you have to come to terms how Jesus died for our sin and our shame. The cross has stood the, the test of time and the symbol of Christianity and Christ throughout the history. Crucifixion has been used as a wicked tool against God's people. Now, it's going to get a little graphic here, okay? We know that Adolf Hitler hated Jews. We know that. He would line them up in shallow trenches and headshots, and because they, had, they were wasting so many bullets on Jews, they said, oh, let's put them in the gas chamber, and we'll save a lot of ammunition. But Hitler also crucified Jews on trees on the side of barns. The Nazis would force their bayonets through their shoulders, necks, and with men, even their testicles. That's what they would do. And by the way, uh, they wouldn't, if they would ever crucify a woman, they'd always put her face toward the cross. Because even, even a despiteful woman who was a thief and a killer murder, they would not want to see a horrific look on a woman's face. It's just FYI. I don't have it in my notes, but it came across. The Karama Ruse, the radical communist movement that ruled Cambodia, from 1975 to 1979, crucified anywhere from one and a half million to two million people, many of them Christians, crucified. In 2002, in Sudan's Darfur region, 88 people, including two children, were, were sentenced to death by hanging or crucifixion. To this day, Islamic extremists around the world occasionally will crucify Christians, a mockery of our Christ. Some nations have used crucifixion to declare that Christianity is outlawed. And then in 1597, 26 people were crucified in Japan for their Christian faith. Crucifixion is basically state-sponsored terror. That's what it is. That's how it's used, even to this day in other countries where basically you're outlawed, you're a villain if you're a Jesus follower. Most scholars uh, pinpoint and point to the Persians as the one who started the whole idea of crucifixion. It didn't start off with the cross, but it started off with just a, a, a wooden pole, and they would sharpen one end, they would bury the flat end, and then they would place the person on, on the pole in a sitting position, you can only imagine. And the person, they would run it through the midsection, ensuring a very violent, bloody, and prolonged death. This continued until the time of Alexander the Great, who added the crossbar, which made the crucifixion more painful and prolonged the death. But crucifixion is really perfected by the Romans. And that's when Jesus was born, it was Roman rule, okay? So this is a big deal. Who ultimately crucified Jesus. The Romans would take turns tormenting prisoners, seeking to elicit the most prolonged pain that they could possibly could. It became something of a sport or competition for the Roman soldiers. I mean, this is wickedness. This is going on today. By the days of Jesus, there were two parts to the cross. The part that stood straight up was called the stipe or post that weighed about 200 pounds. The other part was the patamon or the crossbar. The crossbar weighed about 100 pounds, and the criminal would be forced to carry the crossbar to a place of the crucifixion. And what's interesting is, is that that crossbar was used over and over and over again because why make new ones, right? Because Jesus didn't carry his whole cross. It was just the crossbar, but it's 100 pounds. And so there would be the smell of sweat and the look of, and, the, and taste of blood all over that, that crossbar. And there would probably be some nails sticking out or spikes, as they would say. Just interesting. 
And Jesus was flogged or scourged before he was crucified, which was customary in that day. The scourging would be done publicly and shamefully, much like the beheading on the internet of radical Muslims. I don't know if some of you saw that years ago before they took it off. Just absolutely crazy. It was all about creating terror and fear. Most pictures of Jesus on the cross, this is really interesting, have him high, but he was probably much lower. It was common knowledge among modern historians that most men were crucified at eye level. This is how Jesus was crucified because when they went to put a sponge in his mouth, they were able to do it with a stick. And this would also allow people to look at you in the eye if you're hanging there and they look you in the eye and they would mock you, make fun of you, they would pee on you, they would spit at you, they would mock you. They would place bets on how long, you know, money bets on how long you would live. This is what they did to Jesus. In addition, often they would place incredible psychological torment on the man being crucified by punishing and sometimes executing his wife and children in front of him before his impending death. For example, Alexander Janus, a Jewish high priest, had 800 Pharisees crucified before they died while hanging on the cross. He had their wives and children slaughtered before them. Can you imagine? In 518 B.C., Darius, the king of Persia, crucified 3,000 Babylonians just to warn their enemies. Let's just warn them. In 332 B.C., Alexander crucified, that's the great, and it was also Darius the great, you know, really great guys, crucified 6,000 enemy soldiers along a 120-mile stretch of highway. Imagine traveling on that road, walking or riding a chariot or on a horse, or on a donkey, and 120 miles of people suffering and crying out in anguish, being crucified. And this is, this is the reason the Bible doesn't talk a lot about the scourge and the crucifixion, because if you were to see it, you would never need it explained, and you wouldn't want to think about it. This was the ancient world in, in the way of crucifixion, and some historians believe that Jesus is a boy. This is interesting. When there's 2,000 Jews being crucified because of rebelling the Roman government, we don't know for sure, but it happened around the same time when he was a young boy. Throughout the course of history, virtually all cultures consider crucifixion the worst and most horrendous death. For example, Roman scholar and philosopher Cicero said, crucifixion was the cruelest, most terrible punishment, bar none. The Greek philosopher Plato said, the just man who is thought to be unjust will be scourged, racked, bound, will have his eyes burned out after suffering every kind of evil, and he will be impaled. Now, I hope you can make that next image out on the screen. Can you put that next image out there? See, in the middle, you see that donkey head on the body? You see it? That's scratched on a wall from 200 A.D. and the man crucified as a donkey's head, indicating that anyone who worships Jesus is worshiping a dead jackass. That's what it's saying. And the quote under it in Koine Greek, worships his God. Historically, there is nothing more painful, shameful, more public, horrifying, and haunting than crucifixion. They were considered forsaken by God and sometimes forsaken by family. Often their bodies were left on the cross for vultures or wild animals to feast on the flesh. Sometimes their bodies were thrown into the dump to decompose. And this is the history of crucifixion. Now we're going to transition into the medical part. John 19.1 simply says, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged or scourged. Like I said, that's all that said. You have to kind of do a little historical study what that meant. Flogging was used by Roman soldiers to begin the death process for criminals. They would have had a whip with a wooden handle and long strips of leather. And on the end of the leather, there would be, further out would be like ball bearings. Heavy bearings are really, really heavy stones, coarse. And then behind them would be hooks, either, either bone hooks or like, like a fishing hook sort of a thing. And so the idea was, was they would whip the back, and so the, the bearing would tenderize the back, thus allowing the hook to go in deeper and rip out nice chunks of flesh. In some accounts, even outside, of course, outside Scripture, but some accounts back then, you would, sometimes a man's rib would be flying out. That's how bad it was. Many died just from the scourging. 
It was not fun. Jesus' followers were especially shamed. There's, and, and, I mean, I'm just, I'm just kind of caught up in this moment right now because I'm just reading away. You know, this could, this could come to our nation someday. You know that. And we'll be we stand strong for Jesus. I'm just going to jump to John 19.1. Simply says, Pilate took him and had him flogged. The man's body would be affixed over a stone. They don't know if Jesus was over a stone or tied to a post. His shoulders, back, and buttocks were exposed. A, a soldier would be on each side with the whip, literally whipping the flesh off the man. Contrusions would begin, which sends the heart into a shocked state. They made Jesus carry the cross outside the city to where they hung him. Of course, we know that Simon of Cyrene was assigned that duty. What's interesting is you see these pictures, and it's pictures of Jesus with the spike going through the hand, but most modern scholars and historians believe it was the wrist. In the 1930s, the Germans, and we don't really want to think about how they discovered this, in the 1930s, the Germans did several experiments and determined that a man's hand could not hold his weight, but a nail through the wrist would offer more support. This would rupture sensitive nerve centers, causing involuntary twitching throughout the body. The feet were overlapped, and a single spike driven through them to the wooden post. According to Seneca, the Roman philosopher, I do not have a picture. Some hung upside down, and others, they drove stakes through their genitals. Josephus, the Roman historian, highlights the mass crucifixion of Jews in the days of the Roman Empire, and I quote, out of rage and hatred, the soldiers amused themselves by nailing their prisoners in different postures. Whatever they deem most painful, they would inflict. Some men died from exposure to the elements. Others died of heart failure, dehydration, but asphyxiation or suffocation was the most common reason for death. Some would live up to seven days, and that sometimes if the Roman soldiers got just tired, if they wanted to go home, whatever, they didn't want to do the whole shift, they'd break the legs of the one on the cross, therefore they could not, because you would suffocate, you would push yourself up with your feet or, or your wrist to try and get some air, then go back down, up, down, up, down, so they would break the legs and it would ensure a quicker death. The Journal of the American Medical Association did an intense investigation on the physical death of Jesus Christ, and I quote, it is our intent to present not a theological treatise, but rather a medically and historically accurate account of the physical death of the one they called Jesus Christ. Their findings concluded that the length of survival generally ranked from three to four hours or three to four days, and it appears they have been basic, basically totally related to that flogging, right? To the scourging, because that was really bad. You could die right there. They also reported that since Jesus was offered a drink of wine vinegar from a sponge placed on the stalk of a hyssop plant, approximately 20 inches long, supports the belief that Jesus was crucified on a short cross. We don't know for sure, but it seems that way. Lastly, the American Medical Association deemed that when the Roman soldiers thrust the spear in the side of Jesus, it literally punctured his heart sack, and Jesus virtually died of physical and spiritual broken heart. So that's the historical and medical. I'm going to call the worship team up here. And what we're going to do is we're going to sing a song in worship. Then I'm going to come back up and give the biblical and personal response. We're going to take communion together. It's going to be communion, I believe, like no other. Because Jesus says, remember, when you take communion, remember what I suffered. So, Heavenly Fathers, ask your Holy Spirit, this is difficult, very difficult. But you command us, Lord, to think about your death, your suffering. So we're doing that tonight, and we're moved beyond words. May we sing unto you, our Savior, in Jesus' name, amen.
Psalm 22, 16 says, Jesus would be pierced through his hands and feet. And what's interesting is that was prophetic because it was noted 100 years before the Persians even invented crucifixion. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul declares, hold fast to the gospel I preach to you, 
that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day. And John 3, 16 is clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And I left that type one there for you perfectionists to get healed. It's saying. We need, to, we need to laugh a little bit. I just had to break the ice. The night before his death, Jesus had the Passover meal with his disciples. It pointed back to the days of Moses when God brought death to the firstborn male of every family in Egypt. But if one would sacrifice a lamb and spread the blood on the doorpost, God would pass over the people in that house and their oldest son would live. All of that was foreshadowing Good Friday, like tonight was foreshadowing Good Friday and the horrific death of the Messiah. And this is what's super interesting. During the Last Supper, Jesus began to prophesy, and he was going to be betrayed by someone who was breaking bread at the table, that they would participate in the breaking of his body. Now, could you imagine being there, saying, who is this betrayer? And they didn't know it was Judas. I mean, Judas was well-trusted. You know, he was the treasurer, right? He, they, he, he collected and saved all the money. So, I mean, he's trustworthy. They, they probably didn't expect him. I've always loved John the Baptist, one of my favorite characters. It was he who paved the way for Jesus, proclaimed to large crowds, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb of God is coming. He will take away the sins of the world. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 that Jesus was our Passover lamb, and we should celebrate such when we partake in communion, and we're going to do that shortly. It's going to be a special time. After Jesus celebrated the first communion with his disciples, he spent the entire night in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was overwhelmed thinking about his impending flogging and crucifixion. He did not want to die that way. He knew what that was like. Everyone in that culture knew that was like the worst way to die. According to Luke, and this is the doctor of the third gospel, Jesus began sweating drops of blood when he was in the garden. This is a rare medical condition called hematidrosis and is evidenced in people who are overwhelmed with anxiety. Yes, Jesus' human side. He was 100% God and 100% 100 human. Okay, that's Jesus though without sin. But he was very anxious and stressed out during that time. That's his 100% human side. That's why, you know, we serve a risen Savior that we can identify with. Anyone here ever get anxious, stressed out because of, you know, impending discipline or the PIP plan or whatever's going on in your life? Jesus spent the entire night praying, asking for another way to save sinners. As he prayed and bled, the disciples fell asleep in the garden and abandoned him. Finally, Judas arrives and kisses Jesus, indicating to the soldiers and religious Jewish leaders, this is the guy. Can you imagine the disciples, like especially Peter, who ends up, you know, we're not going to go into the account, cutting off the ear of that soldier. I mean, he, you know, love Peter, right? Let's just Let's just take off some heads here. And he, he wasn't going a sideways swipe. Or take, he was going right down the center of the guy's head. Let's just make it count, right? Probably wanted to kill Judas. There were a series of mock trials, and it was all set up to crucify an innocent man. None of the false witnesses agreed. Jesus was forced to walk miles, dehydrated, asked to defend himself, and eventually blindfolded and beaten without mercy by a mob of men. The Bible says, then Jesus was stripped nearly naked in shame, and a crown of thorns was placed on his head. Then came the horrifying scourging. Jesus' flogging was prophesied some 700 years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. The text literally says that when Jesus would be marred beyond human likeness. What's interesting, I was asked to preach in uh, St. Paul this morning outside for a kind of a pro-life rally, and it was, it was, and this was the text that was given, and uh, yeah, but he was beaten, he couldn't even recognize who he was. Today in Israel, you can still walk the path Jesus walked, bore his cross, the val 
Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross. How many here have walked that? Anyone here? Raise your hand. Yeah, that's really cool. Ann and I went to Israel, but we didn't walk that because we went there specifically to visit the persecuted church, which was really cool. Next time we go, maybe we can go like as tourists and have a... I love, to, I love to walk that. When Jesus arrived at the place of the crucifixion, they drove the spikes through his wrists and feet, some of the most sensitive nerve centers on the body, and like I've said, he began twitching. As Jesus lay upright at eye level, he was mocked by many in the crowd, but Jesus only returned with words of love and hope. Only blessings were on his breath. To the air into his lungs, they would have been incredibly painful. So, theolog so theologians call Jesus' last statements his seven words. Words. They were filled with love. He said, Father, forgive them. And he tells one of the men dying with him, today you will be with me in paradise. According to John 19, Jesus looked at his mother and said, woman, behold your son. Then he said to John, behold your mother. And from that hour, John took Mary and brought her into his home. Now this is the worst part. Worst part. The crucifixion sponge offered to Jesus when Jesus says, I am thirsty. So they put a sponge in his mouth. And so those sponges, every Roman soldier had a sponge in his kit to clean himself. And they would clean themselves out in battle and they would dip it in wine vinegar and clean their buttocks, right? That's what they would do. So when Jesus was thirsty, they grabbed one of those sponges dipped it in wine vinegar, and shoved it in his mouth. In some of those last words of Jesus, he had the scent and taste of feces on his lips. Then Jesus cries, oh my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fact that he says that in such a loud voice probably means he's having a heart attack. And this is near the end, and he, beca he became a curse. And during the full wrath of God, he became a curse for us. In his dying moment, he utters, it is finished. And he does so in a loud, triumphant declaration of victory. And then he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Good job, son. None of his bones were broken, which was fulfillment of prophecy, and... When the creator of the world died about 3 p.m. on a Friday, creation was altered. The sky darkened immediately. Some think it might have been an eclipse, whatever. God could have done whatever he does. That's fine, an eclipse, whatever. It was dark. And then stones started breaking, large stones started breaking in half. I think you would get the message at this point, wow, I think we just, I think God just died. And the curtain in the temple which was a, the width of a man's hand, and up to 30 feet high, they say, was torn from the top down at Jesus' death. And the Father's saying, now we can all enter into that space of the Holy of Holies. After Jesus was declared dead, he was taken to the tomb. What is interesting is Jesus was poor, and he didn't really have a rich man's tomb, but it was prophesied by Isaiah that he would die as a rich man, and Joseph of Arimathea offered his, he was a rich man, offered his tomb, so there was fulfilled prophecy there. Let's take communion. Now I'm going to call the worship team up here also, please. Okay, so if you're, if you're a Jesus follower, you can take communion. And if you're not a Jesus follower, you can take communion. If you just right now decide, I want to be a Jesus follower, because maybe you're realizing for the first time and the Holy Spirit's working in your heart and in your mind saying, no one, no one loves me like Jesus, because he took our sins. He replaced us on the cross.
And so it just, it, it means you just trust him with your life and you start following him. You can take communion with us right now. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic, Catholic or Protestant. We'll even let Lutherans do it. I know, I'm sorry for saying. But, uh, so we, you know, we say this, this represents his body. We've done this like blah, 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 blah. I've been doing communion for 30 years. Blah, 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 blah. Man, I'm telling you, I couldn't fall back asleep that night. Because we, Jesus says, remember how I suffered. So Holy Spirit, open up our eyes and our hearts to your sufferings. May we smell the stench of death on you. May we understand that you endured like a man. You endured for us. May we understand that you really didn't want to do it, but you did it out of obedience. And I pray for those in the house tonight who are not walking in obedience. They're kind of half-baked in their faith. They're not really living for you, but they might know you. Heavenly Father, may they be stricken by your obedience and driven right back into walking with you in that repentance not based on guilt, but based on your love for us. We pray against any unnecessary guilt. We pray that we're all motivated by the love of Jesus Christ, the love of the Father sending his Son. Some of us don't have very good fathers, but we do now. For God's love the world that he gave us Jesus. So I pray for healing in the house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you feel comfortable, if you could stand, please. So this, this uh, juice represents the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross for our sins. And the Bible is so clear, without the shedding of blood, there's, there's no forgiveness. Because, you know, the lambs in the Old Testament, they would uh, sacrifice the lamb and they would you know, put it on the altar or put it over the doorpost and it would satisfy the wrath of God. But just in its temporary way, it wasn't lasting. It was called a kafar in Hebrew, just a covering. But then in, in the New Testament, Jesus' blood is not a kafar. It's not just a covering. It's a washing away of sin and guilt. Okay, that's the difference. And so a lot of us walk in shame. We, we, we're not proud of it. And, and part of it is it's, it's, it's actually prideful if you feel God can't forgive you. If you feel you are so bad, God can't forgive you. That's really, to be honest, that's arrogance and it's pride. Because you think your sin is greater than Jesus' love. And you just have to put that to rest. And you have to repent from your, your arrogance and your pride. And you have to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. So Heavenly Father, I ask for a humility in the house, a repentance in the house. May we repent unto your goodness. I pray for healing in the house. Jesus, thank you for dying for our sins. Thank you for shedding blood. May, may, may your blood just wash away our sins. May we walk in kingdom authority. May we sing with passion to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
so sweet. Here we go.
serve a wonderful Savior, don't we? And so this, this Holy Week has been cut up into three messages. Cole kicked it off with an excellent message Sunday on we hailed, we hailed Him. Today is we nailed Him and Sunday is we follow Him. But I'm just, I'd be remiss not to give an opportunity for salvation tonight. 
before I close in, in prayer, if I'm talking about like, I'm not talking rededication, I'm, I'm talking salvation. Like tonight, you seal the deal with God. You realize that you're a sinner. The only hope is Jesus Christ and he replaced you on the cross. You want to follow him for the first time. If there's anyone in the house like that, just I'm just going to stand right here. Just come and join me right now. Just We're all standing. Just come and join me. That'd be great. We want to wait till Easter. You can do it right now. Anyone in the house want to proclaim their salvation tonight for the first time? If your heart is pounding, maybe it's the Holy Spirit telling you to come on up. Again, this is for salvation. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Jesus Christ, for suffering for us. May your Holy Spirit become evident in our lives. May we be filled with your Spirit. May we be contagious with the love of Jesus Christ. I pray for healing in the families here, for singles, for married, for young, for old. May we all receive your grace, Lord. And Jesus, may we be willing to suffer for you, for your righteousness, Lord, for your glory. And that suffering doesn't look anything like what you suffered, but some of us here are, are suffering right now, and I, I just pray an extra dose of hope on those suffering because you're allowing this. I pray for healing in the house. I pray for faith. I pray for boldness. I pray we invite people to church Sunday because we serve a risen Savior. I pray we leave here reflecting on your goodness. Change us, your only hope. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen and amen.